turn to Luke chapter 10 today, verses 25 to 37. This is a familiar passage of Scripture that um, we have likely heard or thought about before, but I encourage you today to not shift into that mindset, well, I've heard this before, because if there has ever been a point in time when the church of Jesus Christ needs to hear the message of the parable of the Good Samaritan, it is today. So Luke chapter 10, verse 25, I invite you to stand, please, as I read the word of the Lord. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance... A priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Father, we ask now that you would help us to make sense of this text. That you would speak to our hearts and to our lives where we are today. Each of us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. This text, this parable, confronts the human bent to define God and the things of faith on our terms. At first glance, it may not appear that way, but that's what the lawyer has done. Not just the lawyer, it's what most of Judaism had done. They had redefined the faith in a way that they saw fit. So here's what I want you to see in the main idea today is that loving God and loving others are inseparable marks of a follower of Christ. Now let's go back to verse 21. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to, to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. I would argue along with others that what follows this text in verses 21 to 24 are first an example of the wise and understanding in the lawyer and then of the little children in the story of Mary and Martha, which we'll come to next week. So we have a man who knows the scripture and who strictly listen very carefully what's coming out of my mouth now and who strictly seeks to live by what he believes about the scripture now here's what's frightening we live in a secular age where the bible and those kind of things are hardly ever taught or talked about so anybody that mentions the bible we kind of move toward them you gotta be careful with that because you can reinterpret the Bible to mean what you want it to mean and to do what you want to do. And that's basically what this lawyer has done. Now, along with the religious establishment, they see Jesus as a threat. 
So you're going to see repeated examples of them coming to Jesus and seeking to trap him, to make him stumble, to where they can ultimately do what they do accomplish is bring charges against him and have the Romans kill him. Now this confrontation centers around two key questions. These are essential questions that we need to be asking. The first one is, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So the implication here is that the lawyer hopes that Jesus will fail this test. Though the lawyer is asking one of the most important questions a person can ask, what must I do to inherit eternal life? His primary motivation is not to know the answer to that question. Now, Jesus is not going to let him leave the question. But that's not his primary motivation. He doesn't really want to know what he has to do to inherit eternal life. He wants to discredit Jesus and bring harm to him. So Jesus carefully responds. He says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So, so I'm just warning you. You come up to me after a service, and I can look in your eyes and see when you ask me a question, you already have the answer. This ever happened to you? This only happens to me, right? So when somebody asks me a question, I already know they have the answer. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do every time. I'm going to ask you another question. And I'm probably going to ask you, well, what do you think? How would you answer it? This is not original to me. Why does a rabbi answer a question with a question? You want the answer? Why shouldn't a rabbi answer a question with a question? <laughs> what is written in the law? How do you read it? So what Jesus is saying here, how do you interpret it? How, how, what's the implications? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. This is the very heart of the Christian faith. Love God and love others. It's a summary of two texts of Scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That's verse 5. And Leviticus 19.18, the end of the verse says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. So devotion to God is expressed by devotion to others. And there's no distinction to be made between a love for God and a love for others. A devotion to God and how you treat others. These two things go together. So Jesus here is encouraging a total love for God and for other people, for human beings. So he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now this begs the question. Is Jesus then teaching a works-based salvation? That if you do certain things, you earn, if you will, eternal life. Well, and a brief answer to that is, that is not what he's doing. Just a look at the context of what's happening here in this interchange. But certainly if you look at the whole counsel of God, you see that the answer is absolutely not. Jesus is not teaching a works-based salvation. Here's the simple way to answer it. Has this man loved God and loved others? No. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, Jesus is about to show you in just a second that he has not loved God and loved others. I I'll just ask it another way. Has anyone loved God and loved his neighbor as the law states? No. Study Romans chapter 3. No one. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none of us that have arrived at loving God and loving our neighbor in such a way that we inherit eternal life. So has anyone 
loved God and loved his neighbor as the law states? I first answered no, but I'm going to change my answer. Yes. Jesus Christ has. The incarnate Son of God loved God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength and loved his neighbor as himself. So much so that he took our place on the cross and died in our place. We did not earn that, nor did we deserve it. So this asks another question. Where then, in a Christian's life, does love for God and love for others come from? The answer is in the Bible. 1 John 4, 19. We love because... So you are not naturally going to love God and love your neighbor until you first come to terms with the fact that someone has loved God and loved their neighbor and that he loved you so much that he gave his only son who died in your place. When you come to that understanding of the love of God, then something transformational happens inside of you. That love now enters in and we love because we first loved us. It's a quote. It is inconceivable to love God apart from faith. A faith that does not produce love of one's neighbor is dead. James chapter 2, verse 17. It is not faith, and it never was faith. Back to 1 John, just in the next verse. We love because he first loved us, verse 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Now, now, let's, let's, let's just read this again. Because here's where we're going to become lawyers. Well, well, but, 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 How about? This is the Bible stutter right here. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen. He, he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So this response in this text of the lawyer to this instance is likely what you're doing right now inside of yourself if you're feeling lots of conviction at the moment. You're trying to justify yourself. And you'd love to argue with me right now. But, 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 but. So this leads to the second major question. Who is my neighbor? See what it says, verse 29? But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? So the man knows he has not loved God and loved his neighbor fully. So to justify himself and to save embarrassment... He comes back with the question to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Because here's what the religious establishment had done. This is what religion had done. And let's not pretend for a second that this is just in the first century. Let's not pretend for a second this doesn't exist today. And let's not pretend it doesn't exist in this room. The man is really asking Jesus this question. Who is my non-neighbor? So who is the person that I can put into a category or a group of people that I can put into a category that they're not neighbor? In other words, I get the permission to treat this person or this category of people different than the rest of humanity. Or let's just be blunt. I don't have to love them. That means somebody who's your enemy, somebody you consider below you for whatever reason, somebody that you would see as less than a person, somebody who's mean to you, somebody who's on the other side of the political and ideological divide than you. This is another quote. 
You can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the people you do. Let's just, let's just stop and think about that for a minute. You can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. I just want you to think about this for a second before we get into the details of the parable. Jesus is a non-neighbor to the lawyer. He doesn't love Jesus. He's there to trip him up. We are not to ask, who is our neighbor? We are to be a neighbor. And that's what Jesus is about to teach. It's not the object. Who's my neighbor? It's be a neighbor. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. So, if the man is coming from Jerusalem to Jericho, a, man would, a person would go to Jerusalem to worship. So we're going to assume if the person went to Jerusalem to worship and left Jerusalem that this person ethnically is a what? They're a Jew. He falls among robbers. This, parts of this road or this way back to Jericho was called the Blood Road. It was a place where this happened often. And notice it's a group of robbers, plural. It's not one. They fall on this man. They strip him of his clothes. So they take everything. Everything. Everything he has. Then they beat him, leave him there half dead. And you would imagine based off this, if somebody doesn't help him, he's going to die. Verse 31. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now a naked, bloody man stands out. This is not like, is this guy over here taking a nap? He sees him. Now, I've preached on this before, and I've gone to great lengths as to why the priest didn't stop and unclean and blah, 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 and all this stuff. It's very simple why he didn't stop. Non-neighbor. I have no obligation to that human being at all. None. Zero. So however he created the category, however he came up with it, he was able to make a quick decision, non-neighbor. He goes. Now the priest's job was to administer worship, if you will. A Levite comes along whose job was to assist the priest so the priest could administer the worship. So you'd assume out of these two, these two people dedicated to the temple dedicated to the worship of God would do something. That's why Jesus uses them in the story. But it says when he came to the place and saw him, so the implication here maybe is this guy stops. He passed by on the other side. So he comes to the exact same conclusion. Non-neighbor. I don't have to help this man. You say, well, what would you do? Chuck Swindoll tells a story in, in one of his sermons, I assume it's true, that on a seminary campus on a morning at 9 a.m. when a group of students were to turn in a major project on the parable of the Good Samaritan, they actually set up a, a person on the campus who appeared to be beaten up and left, and all of the students, every one of them coming to turn this paper in, walked by him. Every one of them. It doesn't even seem possible that that would happen. But it shows who we are and how we approach things. Now you'd assume he's working his way through Judaism, priest, Levite, and he was just going to say a normal Jew. But no, Jesus turns this story on its ear intentionally to this lawyer 
but a Samaritan. Now, I, I just, I'm, I'm totally imagining here. I have no biblical proof of this whatsoever. I just imagine the lawyer's face when the word Samaritan came out of Jesus' mouth. You could probably hear the whole room. It's like sometimes when I'm preaching, the room goes real quiet. I'm sure it would. Jews hated Samaritans, and Samaritans hated Jews. They had intermixed during the, the time of captivity. Uh, they had married Gentiles and mixed the pureness of Judaism, if you will. They built a temple of their own on Mount Gerizim. That's where the interaction of Jesus and the woman of the well, they're talking about where to worship. Jews considered that blasphemous, that they worshiped there, just simply stated they couldn't stand each other. But this Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So not only did the priest and Levite not see the man as a neighbor, they had no compassion. None. This man is moved with compassion. So he went to him, he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. That is, he administered the first aid the best as he could at that moment for the man. Then he takes more action. He puts him on his animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. So he spends the night with this man, which it implies to us this guy's in serious condition. So he nurses the man overnight. The next day, he takes out two denarii, that is about three to four weeks of room and board. He gives it to the innkeeper and says, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I'll pay you when I come back. So this man obviously moves back and forth through this area. So the Samaritan does all that he could. Now let's go back up to, what must you do to inherit eternal life? Answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, is the man using his heart here? With all your soul, with all your mind, there's thought here, and with all your strength, he acts. And love your neighbor as yourself. You see, these things are inseparable. He doesn't call 911, not that he could have. He acts, he moves, he, he does something. So this leads Jesus to the question then, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Now notice that the lawyer cannot bring himself to say Samaritan. He says the one who showed him mercy. In fact, that's a better way to say it. It's not about Jew or Samaritan. It's about showing mercy, which is birthed out of compassion. This explains what he was to do, what we are called to do, that we're to give and extend people mercy. Brothers and sisters, Jesus, remember, is on his way to Jerusalem. He set his face in the other direction, and he is about to show the whole world what mercy really is. He is about to die in our place and take the penalty of our sins. And remember, we said earlier, we love because So Jesus is right to say, you go and do likewise. Quote, For Jesus, one does not have a neighbor, one is a neighbor. Or better, a person becomes a neighbor. The parable does not require hearers to convert enemies to friends, to do everything for everyone or to solve the problems of the world. To be a neighbor is not a condition that you inherit. In other words, it's a choice that you make to render the tangible assistance one is able to render to someone is, who is in need, irrespective of anything about them. Their politics, their ethnicity, their religion, or their race. We move to them. Jesus has taught this in other places. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. Now while you're turning over there, this is something that I know keeps coming out of my mouth, but it's going to keep coming because it keeps coming out of others' mouths. I am, I am amazed. I really am. I am stunned and shocked at how often I hear professing Christians 
say the following sentence. I hate, and then a person's name. H how is this possible? How, how can we do that? I, I, now you can say, well, Jeff, people are just finally saying what they really thought or how they really feel. Okay, well, is this okay? Even if you don't say it, you're a good Southerner and you bless somebody's heart instead of saying you hate them. Whatever it is, is it okay to hate? Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus said, You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect does not mean you're supposed to be God. This is the word for maturity that's used in Colossians 1.28, telos. It, it, perfect, mature, that we're to give evidence of, of who we claim to be. Love your enemies. So let's just put it out there. I don't care which side of the political divide you're on, I'm going to hem you in. Say so you're driving through the rural part of Gastonia, you come on the road, and there's Donald Trump laying on the side of the road, beat to death. Or, you're in another part of town, and you come along the road, and there's Joe Biden on the side of the road with Nancy Pelosi next to him, and they're both about beat to death. <laughs> you see, now I, I discovered who we're after here. <laughs> but I have heard... My brothers and sisters in this church talk about how much you hate both of these people. Do you really hate them? It's one thing to disagree and to be against an ideology that somebody stands for and to hate a person. This is how we've gotten to where we are in the world because we really do hate. And I'm gonna tell you where we're headed fast. We're headed fast to turn in on each other in this country in ways that are unbelievable, and all you've got to do is go back 150 years and see it's happened before. Here. It's happening all over the world all the time. And here, here's one of the things, you, you can talk about freedom and all these other things that have held America together. One of the things that held America together is the influence of Christians. I didn't say the only thing. I said one of the things. And when we start hating, we're headed for a bad, bad place. So I pray today is a wake-up call for you, for me, and a world that hates. And I've asked myself this question. Do I believe and give evidence that loving God and loving others are inseparable? Do I claim one thing and live the opposite? Do I claim to love God and then have a category of non-neighbor? John brings more clarity to this interchange between Jesus and the lawyer in 1 John chapter 3. I invite you to turn there with me. We know that we have passed out of death into life. So if you've ever asked yourself, am I a Christian? Am I sure I'm a Christian? First John is written for that reason, for assurance. And one of the places of assurance that John brings you back to over and over again is this, this truth, that we know that we have passed out of death to life because we love the brothers. That is a love for the brothers and sisters who are a part of the church brothers and sisters that are in Christ. Now, I've actually heard somebody preach this. I really heard this one time, that the only people that Christians are obligated to love are their brothers and sisters in Christ. And I said to this person after it was over, have you not read the rest of the Bible? That's not what John means at all. He's being specific here, not exclusive. In other words, 
Here's what he's saying. It starts among us. Us, the church. We know that we have passed out of death to life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So who, apart from this sermon, would you get up and walk by this morning and absolutely not speak to them? Period. Who? And don't tell me you don't do it. Don't tell me it doesn't happen here. How how can you claim to love God and do that. That's what, the, that's what the Scripture's asking you today. How can we claim this? Well, you don't know what they've done to me. What if Jesus played that card? What if he did? You would still be in your sin. There's the answer to it. We have sinned against a holy God, but he has shown us mercy. And he teaches us that we now love because he first loved us. So what does my treatment of other people reveal about my love for Jesus Christ? Because here's what Jesus said to all of us. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will. You'll give evidence that you're my people. He goes on to say, that was John 14, he goes on to John 15, and he says, here's how the world's going to know you're my disciples. Here's how they're going to know you love each other. That's how they're going to know. Brothers and sisters, I repeat again, we live at a critical moment in history, and I fear that far too many of us are imitating the culture instead of living what we claim we believe. We are called by Christ to show mercy to every human being. Everyone. Let's pray. When I was preaching a moment ago, was there a person that came to your mind? I'm going to ask you before God to confess your sin against your hatred toward that individual or individuals. Regardless and irregardless of what they've done to you, you you're called to forgive them and to love them. So through the forgiveness that Christ offers you, will you, before God, extend that same love and forgiveness and decide today that you will keep his commandments? Whether it is reciprocated to you or not ever in your life, that you'll love. Lord, help us when we get up from here in a moment to live what we are claiming that we believe. I am so concerned over my own heart and the hearts of those who have gathered here with me today that we could listen to this and still get up and walk out of here and be a lawyer and still believe we're living out what we think we ought to live out the way we think we ought to and completely ignore the clarity of the Bible. You said if, you, if we love you, we would keep your commandments. We confess we cannot do that in our own strength, but we further confess that, Spirit of God, you live within us, that the love of God has transformed us, and that which you have called us to do, you empower us to do. 
So Lord, I pray that through you and through you alone, we would love. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.